On behalf of the Wireless Broadband Alliance, we would like to say a warm hello to everyone and welcome to the Wireless Global Congress Summer Webinar Series. Your webinar is about to commence and all attendees will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the webinar. After each presentation, there will be a question and answer session, so if you have any questions you would like to raise, please enter them into the questions pane on your control panel, which is located at the top right-hand side of your screen. I would now like to hand over to your host for this webinar, Mr. Steve Namasavayam, Director of Membership and Industry Engagement at the Wireless Broadband Alliance. Thank you, and welcome everyone to this webinar on smart transportation. From aviation, connected vehicles, subways and trains, and other forms of public transportation, they all have one thing in common, an increased need for connectivity. Around the world, airlines, automotive manufacturers, and city governments are working to deliver innovative ways to keep customers connected whilst in various forms of transportation. Today, we will examine the challenges and opportunities facing these vertical segments, what technical solutions need to be implemented, and how the WBA members are driving improvements in connectivity for everyone. First, on behalf of the WBA, I'd like to say a big thank you to this summer's uh, Wireless Global Congress sponsors. Our chartered sponsors from the board, Cisco, Intel, and Boingo, and from our membership, Cognitive, Global Reach, OnSemi, Huawei, WideConnect, Maxima Telecom, and Sterlite. Um, we're fortunate today uh, to have uh, uh, some excellent uh, guest speakers. Uh, I'll introduce first off Mikhail Mikonskiti, he's a CTO from Maxima Telecom, Jim Adelson, who's Manager of Planning at Capital Corridors, Chris Bruce, Managing Director for Global Reach Technology, Doug Lodder, Senior Vice President and GM, Carrier Wireless Services at Boingo Wireless, and Don Bookman, Vice President and GM for Commercial Aviation at Viasat. Without further ado, sorry, first off, just so we have an understanding of who's out in the audience, we all think this is a good thing to do, um, we're going to just conduct a short poll. So we'd ask you if you could describe your organization. Just take a few seconds for the results to come through. Poll results are showing now. Okay. Interesting. And then secondly, which mode of transport is, is connectivity most important to you? And we'll come back to the results for this poll at the end of the presentations. Poll is closed. Okay. Okay. As I mentioned, we'll come back to the results uh, later towards the end of these presentations. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our first presenter from Maxima Telecom, CTO Mikhail Mokensky. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Mikhail Minkowski. I'm working with a company called Maxima Telecom, located in Moscow, Russia. Uh, the company was founded in uh, 2013 as a startup aiming to bring high-speed internet to the trains of Moscow Metro System, which is one of the largest metro systems in the world. I think a third in terms of ridership. And we completed this project by the end of uh, 2014, uh, equipped all the trains, and now uh, 
the internet is available for the passengers of the trains in Moscow Metro. Uh, we're involved in quite many projects related to transportation systems uh, and the connectivity of moving vehicles. We built another big TSM trackside network. I'll explain what it is a bit later if uh, it's needed. Uh, in St. Pete, the second largest Russian city, we also uh, implemented a project that brought a cellular 3G coverage on board of the trains through installation of <clears throat> femtocells, small cells, uh, to the trains, and they were connected through our radio link to the core networks of our cell carriers. Uh, we provide uh, live TV streaming on board of the metro trains uh, to the screen that are installed for passengers. Uh, we did uh, our very recent project, we did an upgrade of Moscow network and uh, brought the performance, the throughput uh, increased from uh, roughly 100 megabits per second per train to 250 megabits per second per train. Uh, we were marked as a leader in Wi-Fi advertising and monetization efficiency as one we actually earned money through monetizing the uh, public Wi-Fi networks by Ernst & Young. And also Ernst & Young noted that we operate the largest uh, Wi-Fi network in Europe by the number of connections, which was also a good thing. Uh, so when it comes to um, connectivity for a vehicle, uh, uh, you, the transportation operator needs to make a choice between basically a few technologies uh, that's available on the market, but main two categories of those technologies are cellular and uh, trackside networks. Uh, cellular uh, is basically utilization of the existing coverage of a public shared Wi-Fi network, or sorry, cellular network, or uh, building a dedicated resource uh, within a shared uh, network or even uh, having a dedicated, physically dedicated cellular network for this purpose, which is very expensive indeed. Private uh, trackside network is a network specifically designed for this purpose and uh, it has different architecture than a, a cell network. So what our TSN is, a trackside network is basically a point to multi-point network. Uh, with mobility, so it has an ability to uh, handle a user session between uh, base station so without uh, interrupting. The uh, regular regular TSN consists of a chain or on chain of base stations or access points installed along a track or a route or a way uh, connected to each other, usually through fiber. Uh, and radio is installed on board of the trains or uh, other vehicles uh, that are capable to connect to those base stations, switch between them as the vehicle moves. So regular TSN, uh, modern TSN can produce average uh, throughput of up to two to 300 megabits per second per vehicle. If we speak about just a single radio installed on each vehicle, there could be more than one vehicle radio with aggregated traffic, which has its own person constant, more unusual case. What's important to mention here that uh, trackside networks, unlike cellular networks, are highly optimized for this type of uh, communication, for the topology, which is uh, linear topology, long chains of uh, base stations connected to each other. So they might have special types of signaling, special algorithms optimized for this usage pattern. And which is also important to mention, uh, there are no common standards in this area, almost no common standards, uh, which actually leads to poor interoperability of different vendor solutions. Uh, when uh, a transportation system operator uh, makes a choice of a technology or an approach how to provide connectivity to the vehicles, uh, first thing needs to, that needs to be done is to analyze, to categorize the application that, are, that need uh, connectivity. We can uh, distinguish three different groups of types of applications. The first group actually requires quite high bandwidth. It's a group, of, but, but, but doesn't have quite uh, big requirements to the uh, link parameters, other link parameters, and to link availability. These applications are passenger internet service, <clears throat> uh, onboard entertainment, uh, digital advertising, things like that. 
and any type of uh, backhaul, any type of uh, radio link between a vehicle and the ground can be used here, including public cellular network, if only it's available and has enough resource indeed. Second group of applications is basically more business critical application that are might not require that much bandwidth, but so much more sensitive to the channel link quality. However, they still can sustain short interruptions, so they do not require that high availability. This type of applications would include passenger information systems on board security and video surveillance, uh, cell coverage through small cells, uh, telemetry, and uh, things like that. Uh, for these applications, uh, public cellular networks are no longer an option, while dedicated cellular networks, or semi-dedicated, I mean, uh, not physically dedicated, but cellular networks with some dedicated resource allocation, are still an option, but needs to be considered case by case because it's uh, really a subject to, for, to availability and to fitting the requirements of a particular application, while trackside networks are still a perfect fit. Finally, uh, I need to mention mission critical applications like uh, CBTC, driverless vehicles that usually use uh, dedicated, uh, physically dedicated special radio networks uh, for uh, the operation. But uh, we think the situation is changing right now because uh, the level of maturity of trackside networks reached the point when trackside networks designed against according to proper guidelines could be used for these applications as well. So when a, an operator makes a choice of the right technology, uh, it turns out that uh, with a clear trend to increase of uh, requirements uh, to uh, link quality and availability, the only choice that would allow uh, having a, a single universal communication media uh, covering all uh, requirements of all applications would be a trackside network. Uh, right now, as I said already, trackside network are capable of providing two to three hundred megabits per second per vehicle, which is good enough. However, uh, it's no longer be good enough in two to three years with the uh, growing uh, demand on connectivity from transportation systems. And we expect a big boost in performance of trackside networks. Within uh, five years, we expect having uh, products supporting uh, 10x. Uh, speeds like multi-gigabit uh, speeds. Uh, the main uh, uh, reason for that is a shift to millimeter wave band uh, frequency bands. Uh, need to mention that it's uh, the same thing that happens in Wi-Fi world and uh, in uh, the, the cellular communication world, both 5G and Wi-Fi introducing new standards and uh, new equipment and uh, millimeter wave bands and trackside networks would follow. We think that uh, increased availability of uh, millimeter wave band radios uh, for 5G and Wi-Fi will boost also uh, TSN product development and reduce costs uh, of uh, millimeter wave based TSN devices. The other thing that needs to be mentioned is that uh, the transportation system is a very complex thing that uh, behaves uh, in a very complex and uh, unpredictable way sometimes. Uh, its uh, characteristics, its parameters evolving uh, over time and uh, over even short periods of time. For example, busy hours operation is very different from normal hours operation. The number of vehicles, the traffic generated by vehicle, usage patterns, distance between vehicles, uh, vehicle speed are very different. Any mobile network uh, should adopt the behavior uh, to the actual uh, real-time situation in the transportation system. And uh, it cannot be done well enough through any pre-programmed controlling algorithms, uh, if it's static or um, programming, because uh, physically the network is not changeable. You cannot move base stations, you cannot change distances between them. What you can do, you can uh, adapt the behavior of the network uh, based on the uh, actual situation uh, within the transportation system. But to do that, you need to uh, introduce new features like machine learning and artificial intelligence to this space, to controlling space. And we expect the product supporting uh, artificial intelligent machine learning controllers will be available on the market pretty soon. Uh, partially, they are already available. Last but not least that I would like to mention about 
uh, TSN. Uh, the, again, that uh, there is a clear lack uh, of uh, standards and guidelines that uh, basically uh, prevents from uh, good development in this space in some cases. We, uh, the, the two main problems that we have, one is that, uh, as I mentioned already, the uh, products from different vendors are, are not uh, compatible to each other, so poor interoperability. Customers uh, have to become a, uh, users of just one vendor. It's very hard to switch between vendors because the requirements, the guidelines, the design patterns are pretty much different. And uh, the dependency of a single vendor with proprietary solution is something that is uh, very bad thing for, for a customers and also for network operators. The other thing is that um, the lack of uh, widely accepted clear design guidelines and uh, requirements guidelines and certification programs actually makes uh, some of the projects uh, impossible due to uh, in, impossible customers' requirements, customers that do not have deep understanding of what uh, what can be achieved, what cannot be achieved with the trackside networks, produce crazy requirements that cannot be implemented within the uh, budgetary allocation that they have. So uh, we think that WB within uh, this uh, stream can become a headliner, can improve the situation and bring some uh, guidelines and uh, and. Uh, maybe even standards in the future to the market to make some, to bring some order to this uh, a bit chaotic uh, space. That's basically it for, for the introduction. It's a very short one indeed, but that's how much time I had. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mikhail. Very insightful. Thank you for sharing the views there for Maxima. Um, on your last slide, you talked about certification and guidelines. So, so one thing I can share from a, a WBA perspective is that this topic of transite connectivity, uh, some of the members have been discussing this. We have our, our call for projects um, coming up next month in, in August, uh, and it's one of the projects that's actually being considered here as well. So hopefully uh, we can move forward and uh, have, uh, have Maxima uh, participating on this as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I just want to open it up to the audience and see if there are any questions. So I'm just checking here if anything came in, and we've, we've got a couple. Um, so one question that came in, Mikhail, how are customer expectations changing in terms of access to Wi-Fi when on the move? Okay, uh, so perhaps if you could share some insight, that would be be uh, useful. Thank you. Um, no, thank you. Uh, still, I'm um, not sure that I got the question correctly. Changing uh, in, in, in what sense? Uh, changing compared just, just in to terms the, of a passenger yeah, next so. normal Wi-Fi network or, or changing. Yeah, I, I think just in terms of, uh, of their experience on the Wi-Fi, the passenger experience, you know, how that's changed. Mm -hmm. When on the move. I think that yeah, I think that the, there is no any change. A customer, if we speak about a physical person, a passenger, would expect the same level of quality and uh, uh, speed uh, of any Wi-Fi network. And uh, the purpose, uh, one of the purposes that we have uh, when designing and building Wi-Fi networks and board networks is to provide seamless experience so that the customer would uh, not feel any difference uh, connecting to uh, Wi-Fi network on board of a moving vehicle or in the station or stop or in the city. And indeed, uh, the key thing here is uh, link quality, so it should be stable and, 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 and fast enough. And the other thing is onboarding, onboarding in the sense of connecting to the Wi-Fi network. These two things are key things in Wi-Fi world always, and uh, there is no any difference for, for moving vehicles. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, um, just uh, checking. I think uh, we should move on with the agenda. So uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce you to Jim Allison uh, from Capital Corridors. He's a manager for planning. Uh, so Jim, you have the floor. Great. 
Well, thank you very much, Steve and WBA. Um, great presentation from Michael. He's really raised a lot of the very important issues that uh, we face uh, or try to face in, in many markets around transportation, at least ground transportation. So I'm gonna share the screen that should be all set up. Um, I'm gonna be talking about this in a, a inner city passenger rail perspective, and I'm the manager of planning, as it was said. So I will thread through this. We've been working with uh, Wi-Fi on trains for a while. Our agency is kind of a hodgepodge of um, aspects of transportation kind of meshed together. We don't own our stations. They're owned by the local jurisdiction. Our track area is mostly owned by a freight railroad. So we're a tenant and we work with all of these entities that you see on the slide to pull off what's known as the capital corridor service. And we're a joint powers authority combining the powers and authorities of the different jurisdictions and state law in California to operate this. So that's just part of the um, system that the background that we have. This is our service area. Um, our main drivers, you can see Silicon Valley down in the lower southern section and then the East Bay and San Francisco markets. And um, most of our folks travel from the more uh, affordable areas near Davis and Sacramento into jobs in the Bay Area. And they'll spend a lot of their day on the train um, going back and forth. So it's become part of their lifestyle. So that's how um, they use our service as part of the lifestyle. So Wi-Fi on the trains is part of delivering um, to that those options that they have. And so we're trying to obviously make Wi-Fi on trains the, the uh, option that they want to select. And you can kind of see our service levels here. Of course, COVID has depressed those significantly right now, but uh, we'll be back someday soon, I hope. So the thing that we can own is our relationship because we don't own anything else, but we can own the relationship to the customer. And that we definitely are aggressive on and we were starting in on Wi-Fi because we knew it was in a, a desired passenger amenity. Um, back in 2003, we started with some trials and it's our culture really to innovate and stay on the cutting edge of um, this uh, service, which is changing all the time. And again, Mike Mikel raised a lot of those points. Uh, they have one of the most amazing systems in the world, but you can't just celebrate at that. Things are changing all the time and the, the demands change. So we've seen that change over time since we started and we are undergoing a change right now. Um, our first system was installed in 2011 and uh, that system right now is uh, in the process of being upgraded to a more modern system. And I'm gonna talk about that change and why we've, how we've gone about that change uh, next. So we've moved from a traditional procurement model where you buy the, the asset and you put it out there and you, you, you uh, let it run and do its job. Um, we've shifted to a service model. And the reason is with technology, um, a procurement, at least the way government is set up, it's not productive to buy a piece of technology and watch it age in place. So we changed the dynamic in this most recent procurement. We've gone to a service model, which is almost kind of like a lease. And we don't want to own any of the equipment. We will certainly pay the vendor for it, but we want that equipment to be changed over time so we can keep up with customer expectations. And that's what I wanted to talk about here. The service models, key ingredients for doing that as opposed to the lump sum capital project with some operation and some maintenance. This is the product um, that we're delivering to the customers that's going to keep track with the pace of technology. So um, the two key ingredients that we use are a product roadmap from the vendor that we've selected. So we wanna see where, where things are headed, both in terms of um, modems, in terms of um, access points, in terms of data and in terms of speed over time. And we keep track of all of that in a pro forma. So um, this pro forma kind of needs some Excel mastery, but um, when we do this service model, we have a long-term contract that we uh, do for the vendor community, the, the team who's won. And oops, seems like I've lost the screen there. Just a second. 
Let's see if I can go back to that. One moment. I don't know what you're seeing. Uh, we're seeing the service model key ingredients, Jim. Okay, interesting. So I think, is that the one that we're... Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that's, uh, uh, my screen has changed. So let me get, I'll just move that along this way. So um, if we're back to it now, you should see an example of a service model over time. Great. Yeah. Um, so the service model is um, one where we purchase an initial package of um, technology and installation, and that's represented kind of by that green line, and we pay a monthly cost. We pay this off over time, it's amortized. And then the um, labor is paid off at some point in time, and then we it's time to upgrade part of the, uh, the hardware stack. So that represents another bump. And you can see changing over time, the monthly dollars change, and we get the, the advantage of um, installing um, the core components of the system, the cables and things like that, that won't change as rapidly, but we do change over some of the uh, hardware, the CCU, the, the, the processors, the modems, those kind of things. And so we review over time the roadmap and we adjust the pro forma to account for that. So moving on, the hardest thing on a service model is you're kind of catching everything in uh, it's running along already, so you're um, you're you're getting different pieces of bits of hardware in different life cycles, and so we don't obviously know where we are and when things are coming when we purchase this initially. So um, it's a little obscured for the future. So we start off and understand that some pieces of hardware will be replaced sooner than others, and that builds us into a kind of an amortization model, and that is captured in Verforma, and we know over time we're gonna be replacing certain pieces of hardware to keep as close to optimal on that speed and bandwidth and service delivery model as possible. So that's how the service model is used. And then in the future, we shift, and then we go into, for instance, replacing hardware Y, which is starting its new life here, and we'll amortize that over time. So this is the service model approach that we're using. So the reason, again, that the service model is working for us is that it's there to match the pace of technology changing over time. Um, it's built also around the use of data open standards that um, we've insisted on with our third party uh, um, team that oversees this system and it drives very open communications and attentive management of the resources that we have, all of which lead to achieving better customer uh, expectations on the train, better customer service on the train. Now, unfortunately, we have COVID in, <clears throat> in the way here, so the fewer people on the train are getting a better service, but we don't have the, we only have one uh, new car replaced right now. So as Mikhail said, it is a challenge in transportation to keep on top of technology changing all the time and to keep um, keep things current. But for right now, those who are on the train are getting are going to be getting a better experience than they had before. And when they come back, we'll hope to see more oops, more service delivered to them. So whoa, jumping ahead here. Um, the service model is really a relationship. And we are starting from a basis working with our vendor, our selected vendor. Um, we know the rough pricing schemes, we know what's appropriate, and um, we can project our budget out to what their budget, <clears throat> to what their hardware expectations are uh, to be changing over time. So it also, as I mentioned, paces itself towards uh, technology changing. And one of the reasons we do this is the technology changing so fast makes procurement very difficult for, especially for a public agency. It's such a big effort to go through that. And um, rather than refreshing an entire system every couple of years because the technology has changed, the longer term relationship invests that partner on a longer basis. The vendor values, whoever wins values the um, relationship and um, has a roadmap and the stability of cash flow to uh, deliver on the project over time. Um, we can also insert different penalties if they don't perform, that kind of stuff. That hasn't happened, certainly in our case. 
Um, the COVID situation has interrupted our delivery because uh, we couldn't uh, get at the trains or get to the trains because of lockdown. But other than that, we're kind of recovering pretty well here and they're on pace to um, deliver a, a completely updated system in about uh, four more months for our, on, our, um, on our trains. And I did in, want to emphasize the difference between uh, much of Mikhail's, the, the Moscow situation is our backhaul is largely, it's all cellular uh, because we don't own our tracks. So we're using the available cellular networks along the route bundling that and delivering that through Wi-Fi hotspots into the cars. So there's a fundamental difference. We'd, I would love to own the track and have a track side network and have longer, you know, better speeds over time, more consistency, but in our situation, we don't have that. And there are many situations around the world where that's just not practical, but I think track side networks are sort of the ideal. So the service model is really, for me, as we went through this transition of watching something age in place, to now in the future where things will not age in place, they'll be updated over time. We're gonna stay on track of those customer expectations over time. And that's, that's why we're doing this uh, new approach. And um, it, it's still kind of a work in progress, but it's really going well. It's opened up a quite a good dialogue between the vendor community, their hardware, and their community that they get suppliers uh, of their hardware from. So it, it creates better alignments all along. So one, one last slide. That's uh, hopefully I've used up my time there appropriately. Uh, if there's any questions about that, uh, that's my contact information and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jim. Yeah, no, very, uh, very insightful. Thank you for sharing that from Capital Corridors. Yep. Um, a few questions have come in. Um, Two, one around two have come in. One around the uh, ridership and the uh, the passenger experience. The other around the cost model. So just addressing the first question in terms of the ridership and what Capital Corridor's aspirations are from a, a passenger experience are. Could you could you share what the what the uh, the top drivers are? Well, for our customer base, we like I was mentioning at the outset, we have a lot of people that commute from one location uh, where they live to their um, place of work and they don't want to drive and they want to be productive in route. So Wi-Fi has become hugely important. So that is probably, it's usually one or two in terms of the ranking of what's important on my trip is having that free Wi-Fi experience is a, is a game changer. And early on when we did our first initial installation in 2011, um, soon thereafter we researched um, with a research team what effect it had on our ridership. And we got about a 2.4 to 2.7, depending on methodologies, bump in ridership because of having Wi-Fi. And for the cost of that over time, that was a, you know, that's a, one of the better investments we've made in terms of driving people to get on the train. So I, I think over time, we're seeing people value it for um, staying connected to their workplace. Um, and as we improve the speeds, um, you know, the use of the internet is changing all the time. The web pages change, so we need to keep pace. And I, I, I think this next generation is important because we had such a long flat period where we essentially had the same service, and now we're going to be able to change the modems out and keep on keep on speed, keep it keep that pace. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, that actually takes us nicely onto the to the second question that came in around the what you refer to as a service model. So could you share what the, uh, the cycle refresh is on some of the uh, the onboard uh, train equipment? I guess it's the CQs, the modems, and so on that you uh, referred to earlier. Yeah, the cycle's different. Our probably minimum access points seem to change uh, very quickly. Um, those might change out every two to three years. Um, the CCUs, some of the componentry of them, the um, the processors, those might last three to four years. <clears throat> the um, modems also change. So those are the big ticket items. The roof antennas don't seem to change that often. Um, so we can really benefit from that large um, capital and labor investment. And the pieces that get swapped out are relatively minor and accessible within the train environment to swap out. So those are the, the timing pieces. So that's the... Uh, 
that's kind of what we're doing. We're now, we'll be looking to do swap outs and we're about to have another product roadmap so that I know budgeting wise in about two years, it's time to replace these pieces. So that, that's kind of the refresh rate. So uh, at the vendor community that serves um, our provider, which is Nomad Digital, um, is somebody that they're talking to that indus those industry members to refresh access points, uh, upgrade firmware, those things all the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, we had a, another question come in along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so it asks the question, if cellular is available along the track already, why would users use Wi-Fi? Good question. We've had that one for a long time. Um, the users use Wi-Fi mainly to uh, avoid being charged uh, for their data usage. They, they stay below the data cap that they have. Um, it's also variable along our route in terms of which carrier is the the best. Um, there's also the aspect of your, while you're in the train, you're in a kind of a metal cage in terms of uh, accessing that cellular network. And while we do this, uh, you can uh, access, you know, by more powerful antennas to the cellular infrastructure nearby. But mostly we feel it's folks that either don't want to use their data plan, or even if they have a data plan, they appreciate the convenience of it. And we don't just keep it there we have a landing page we have content on that page um, so while they're in the journey it's it's a little more like you're seeing in the airline industry where you've got content there facing you and that, that's going to be a feature in the next in this next generation piece coming up okay perfect okay thank you all right so uh just uh if we move on so a quick time check so we're doing well uh, on the schedule so far so we'll move forward on to to our next speaker so we have a uh, don bookman uh, from viasat who's a vp and gm for commercial aviation uh, viasat are a wba member and make uh, key contributions to our in-flight work group as well okay uh, so don uh, over to you i had to unmute first so apologies for that Okay, hello all. Thank you, uh, Steve, for having me on. Thanks, Jim and Mikhail and all our other speakers. Um, very good. So are you guys seeing my main screen, Steve? Yeah, perfect. Okay, very good. Okay, so uh, yeah, quick introduction. Don Butchman, uh, Vice President and General Manager of our Commercial Aviation Division here at Viasat. Um, today, I'm going to kind of talk through, just sort of take a moment in time uh, of sort of what, you know, what this, in this pandemic environment, sort of uh, you know, touching passengers and delivering Wi-Fi and connectivity to passengers in this in sort of these changing times. And uh, just sort of a, I haven't checked Twitter for 10 minutes, so I don't, I don't know if the world's changed, so it probably has um, kind of going along. Okay, so a little bit about Viasat, you know, as Steve mentioned, we're a WBA member. We do quite a bit of delivering, you know, we, we deliver not only to government, um, you know, to hard, to hard to deliver places within our government customer set, and our commercial side of the house, which is where my business lives, um, you know, we're delivering to really difficult places and even common places like the home. Um, and you know, the business internet, community Wi-Fi. So you think of sort of places that just don't have access to good 3G, 4G radios um, and Wi-Fi connectors out there. We're sort of bringing Wi-Fi to the community. Um, you know, commercial aviation and business aviation. So in flight, and then and you know, at the seas and maritime and. You know, in the past, we've done rail. Um, we've delivered rail into um, France, and so I'm, you know, quite familiar with Jim McHale's uh, area as well. So we're just continuing to deliver it, and it's all sort of the, the the backbone of our technologies is our satellite constellation. So we've invested in the highest capacity satellites around the world, um, getting ready to launch Viasat 3, which is our terabit per second class. Um, and just for those non-satellite folks, that's a lot of capacity. We, we're leading the we're leading the world. Um, yeah, we came out Viasat one, announced in 2008. It was 140 gigabits per second, and Viasat three was, you know, it was doubling that. And now Viasat or Viasat two doubled that. Now Viasat three. So we're just continuing to, to up it. And as you guys said, the you know the reason we're doing that is that's our upgrade path. Is when you sort of run out, we have to upgrade our radio because that tends to be the channel that gets clogged. And the radio in these cases is our satellites. Okay, so the first poll question. I'm not quite sure what to do now. I forget. They told me to wait. 
Okay. Okay. So uh, you know, one of the things I want to see is sort of in this in this sort of pandemic environment, I just want to get a sense of when do you start expecting to fly again? You know, there's different classes of who's flying, and sort of you know, give me sort of your you know, I'm already flying now. Maybe the next one to five months, six months, maybe after a vaccine, and maybe I just don't know if I'll ever fly again. Any votes are still coming in, so just be a couple of seconds more. Okay, yep, I'll be patient. Okay, if you're on a plane now watching this and you're on one of our systems, you can't complain because it's slow because ours is really fast. <laughs> okay, so, yep, so, it's, you know, just kind of what we're seeing, sort of not many people are flying today. That's sort of what, you know, if you look at the daily TSA screenings and uh, kind of a little bit of wait and see approach there in the middle. Okay, thank you. And I think I might have actually, oh, do you have to give me the PowerPoint again? Uh, there's back. Okay, so question four is another question around the polling. And now it's sort of seeing when you are traveling, how important is having uh, high, having reliable in, in flight connectivity? And so again, I'm, you know, taking it from the passenger's perspective on an airplane. And so how important is that? I'm not sure if we're going. Yeah, we are going. Okay, just let me know when the poll is uh, completed. Not yet. Not okay. quite. Yes. I've seen to lost my little command center dealy thing here. I seem to have lost my mouse. Oh, there we are. Okay, quick poll. There's the results. Okay. Very good. So essentially, and that's kind of what we're seeing now is sort of most folks are, you know, where Wi-Fi was sort of, a, you know, it had been, had been going from sort of a, oh, it's a nice to have to become essentially we called hygiene, you know, in a pre-pandemic stage when hygiene meant, you know, something that, you know, was associated with a must have. Um, and I would say even now it's really is and pretty important. Um, and we'll see about, looks like about 60% uh, are sort of in the in, important category and then the other 40% are, uh, I would say indifferent as, as the poll question says. Okay, thank you all for that. Okay, so we'll get back to my uh, presentation. So are we seeing this now, Steve and Allison? Am I? Uh, you're on your uh, first slide still. So if you transition through, we're still seeing slide one. Uh, uh, slide. Okay. You're still seeing uh, slide one. Today's okay. connected what? passenger. Yeah. Okay. Oh, today's connected passenger. Okay, you're still seeing this. Who's you're seeing? Who's who is traveling? No. 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 So you're on your first slide uh, so far. It might be if you put it into full screen. Uh, yeah, let's see. Let's maybe I have to get out of this and start again. So let's move forward to slide six. So I should be on who is traveling now? Is that a... No, no, you're on uh, slide six, can utilizing mobile enhance the feeling of safety. Okay. Huh. Seems to be... Uh... I'm, uh, I'm struggling with the technology. Sorry, folks. I'm trying to talk through it here really quick. Uh, let's see. So if I... I can drive it if you'd like. Jim. Yeah, maybe that's not bad. Yeah, uh, since I'm not doing so well. Okay. Um, yeah, so just uh, tell me when to transition. Okay, yeah. Why don't you keep going? Um, yeah, go to the next. Let's go past the two questions. Okay, so who's traveling? Yeah, let's stay here. Thank you, Steve. Um, so the, it's actually better. Than I can see myself now, so I don't feel like I'm talking into an empty void. <laughs> so it's a little, little more user friendly. Uh, so who's traveling, right? So we talked about that. Right now, if you kind of watch the daily, you know, we've had a, you know, July sort of in here in the U.S. at least that we we sort of seen passengers pick back up. You know, Europe opened up again with their borders and the mandatory quarantines. We saw Australia domestic going again. 
but still we're about 75 percent uh of people traveling by airplane that, that were last year at this time um and just like the um what we saw before a lot of the polls out there like you know this this group is very similar about 30 38 percent are going to wait before the pandemic sub, you know subsides they basically i don't have a reason to travel i won't um and you know i think the COVID 19 is really concerning and it's not just in the airplane the airplane tends to get the highest uh you know, it tends to be most sensationalized because we're so close together, um, you know, in the seating arrangements, very similar to other mass transits. Um, but, you know, you have the whole travel ribbon, right? You have the airport, you have the taxi, you have the hotel, um, you have the shopping, you have the restaurants, you know, so pretty much every long, when you think about your travel ribbon pre-pandemic, how many spots you were in, but today you may, uh, may think twice about. Okay, Steve. And so what could we do? Um, kind of on next you know so let's say we have you know we have wi-fi one of the things we're seeing and one of the trends that you've sort of read a lot of the pundits is we have uh there's a kind of a the pandemic is sort of accelerating our digital transformation in a lot of these industries and i think the airlines is one it's there and so think about from the airline the crew and the passengers perspective what can be a frictionless connectivity and again you know by yeah you know, one of the sort of the underpainings of what we're doing and what we think is really important is actually having good connectivity, right? If you just have connectivity, but it's not very good, you've tended to feed the purpose of having it. But once you sort of get across that sort of basic premise, you know, what else can you be doing? And, you know, so from the, from the cruise perspective, you know, there's a lot of past interactions that used to be what I would call, you know, aisle walks, right? Someone rings the call bell, they, they're thirsty for a glass of water. You know, the, our flight crew would have to kind of go from the you know galley up to the passenger back to get the water and back again. So it's sort of four transfers and right. So we can digitize that and have sort of virtual calls and virtual interactions, whether it be text or you know simple interactions to sort of cut down on, on those person-to-person -person, you know possibilities. You know during the pandemic stage that would help give pause. The airline can communicate to the passenger. So you think of the device getting on. It's now another means, you know, it used to be the seat back uh, magazine was a was mostly how you sort of communicated once a person was in their seat. Now with their device, they we saw from the poll, a lot of people do want to be connected, do want to get on. If you can make that frictionless and you can give, you know, the airline can have an opportunity to update the passenger, sort of, hey, what's the hygiene of this of this plane itself? You know, when was it last cleaned? What's what's the airport I'm going into? How is that airport clean? You know, what's the cleaning schedule? What are the local rules? Say I'm flying internationally. Is there a quarantine rule? Is there a check-in or is there a, anything else? Um, sort of in this unknown times when from you know, here in the United States, state to state, county to county, town to town may have different mandates You know, on say masks or social distancing. So you can communicate and sort of take out a lot of that unease in the passengers by this sort of digital interface. And, um, and, and for the passenger, the passenger is also, you know, there's a lot of new tools coming in. You know, Jim had mentioned just entertainment on trains, you know, that sort of maybe the trains will start tracking what the airlines have been doing. You know, we've seen the seatback screens in the back of the seatback, or you can use your device to watch entertainment. But in either case, technology is advancing. So my device is, becomes the one that I'm touching. And I don't have to touch sort of what's a, a common device, you know, out there, say the seatback or something else. So it's in this sort of safe environment, I think this, you know, the pandemic, you know, I think we, we really can you know, make, make a difference, bring new tools to the party that sort of help give everybody at ease and help communications, make the airline a better airline, make the crew feel safer while they're doing their fundamental essential job, which is the safety of the aircraft, um, but also, you know, protecting themselves, right? Because we're not going to have a safe aircraft if our crew is sick. And in the passengers, you know, they basically, you know, they have a reason to go from point A to point B. And, you know, with the environment, they want to be able to have assurances they can get there, you know, within a pretty safe environment. Okay, Steve, uh, we're the next. Okay, so, you know, kind of, you know, finishing up is, you know, this frictionless and something that, you know, is really important for us with WBA is this sort of that frictionless. You know, one of the things we see is, you know, we offer a lot of our, our airline customers offer the service for free to passengers, so Wi-Fi free. And Jim, I think, and Jim, in your talk, you were saying now is an important piece of the rail and sort of not using your own device. So in the air, you don't even have that 3G, 4G, 5G radio option. Um, but there is other friction, right? And so part of it is just Wi-Fi itself can be friction, right? So you're using using the you know the roaming protocols that we're developing to allow somebody to kind of walk in and what we call it's just works. You know that means you know you sort of have your phone next to you just like you sat down in a coffee shop and all of a sudden you get an alert 
you know, it's a Slack message, it's a text message, it's some other news alert. You pick up your phone, you start interacting, you don't even realize that you're online. In an airplane, that's not quite possible because you have a lot of friction to go through of connecting to an SSID and sort of running through, maybe paying. And so one of the things that we sort of see is to bring the greatest utility is to sort of try to find new business models and new constructs and new technologies that allow that seamless roaming um, you know, on the ground in the air. And it shouldn't, it's not just at home, it's really the on the ground experience. It's just how you interact with your devices. You're not dragging your 70 inch uh, flat screen TV with you on, but you are dragging the same devices that you go around the ground with. And those are the ones that we wanna make sure they work and make sure they're safe and uh, access you know, things I wanna do. And you know, when it comes to quality, you want to make sure that you know I want the content I want to watch. So if I've got a, you know, name the latest you know streaming site that just came out, Peacock, or HBO Max or Netflix, you know, going back, you know, Netflix is now old school, you know, and all the new ones coming out. You know, but I want access to my subscriptions on my device. You know, that's a that, that's a comfort, right? That's a comfortable feeling knowing that okay, I'm in this seat. It's not my seat. It's not my screen in front of you. But hey, I got my content, my device. Um, and then live content, right? You know, also news, right? I, I sort of had an opening joke about not seeing Twitter in the last 10 minutes, but it's a real, the fear of missing out is becoming you know, almost minute by minute as the world's changing, news is coming out and things are changing. And so being connected to the news um, you know, about what's happening in the world today is really important to sort of know what to expect. So that um, I think that's it, Steve. I think that was the final one looking at my, my move off memory. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it is. Thank you. Well, thanks for yeah. stepping in there, Steve. No, no problem at all. Thank you, Don, for, for sharing that great insight. That was perfect, actually. So, yeah, we have had a few questions uh, come in, actually. Uh, so, yeah, one question uh, goes takes us back to the COVID-19 situation. But in terms of in-flight Wi-Fi, you know, do you uh, view it as less important now um, as most people are taking short-haul flights as opposed to long-haul? Um, no, um, you know, we're seeing, you know, so maybe short haul has a different perspective for us, you know, short haul, maybe, you know, you think of regional US, but, you know, New York to LA is still a five hour flight, um, less ground time because there's less, uh, less ground traffic, um, but it's still, you know, still long flights and we're seeing, you know, we see, we, we have shuttle flights in our systems that are free that are say LaGuardia to Boston, right, that are actually competing with local rail. So some of the airlines and local uh, transit compete and free Wi-Fi has become important and we see really high engagement rates even on what might was essentially a 15 minute flight. So we don't really see the flight time, you know, the just being connected is important as long as it's frictionless. As long as you can get on and get on easily, you know, being connected is just as important for five hours as it is for 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and another question about data speeds has come in. Um, so what types of data speeds are going to be available for passengers uh, in the next few years and how does it compare to uh, terrestrial 5G, I guess? Yeah, so, you know, we're, you know, we're, you know, well, 5G is kind of, we've seen kind of data rates all over the map, you know, it depends on your proximity to the tower. Um, but for us, what we've been selling is, a, is an experience that, and we've been selling for a long time, which is, and it's really, I can do what I want to do. So, you know, we sell 12 to megabits per second is sort of peaks you see, you often see, you know, quite higher. But you know, it's it's good enough to stream you know your DVD quality videos you know uh, effortlessly and seamlessly without any buffering. You could pretty much do all the applications on your devices that you expect to do, whether it be email, VPN, browsing, um, even web. You know, even doing something like this. I've done a lot of you know from free services on our airplanes. I do a lot of WebExes. You know, doing video conferencing. I think I'm not supposed to, but uh, that's a different story. Uh, but yeah, it's so the you know the speeds you know speeds are continuing to increase, but it's really about capacity. It's you know speeds are one thing, but the more people want it, what you don't want to do is set up an environment where from the first person on, I have a fast speed, and then once a hundred people join from that airplane, the speeds crash. For us, the first person and the hundredth person and beyond have the same speed, right? And that's not speed as much as it's capacity and bandwidth. That's why we're investing in terabit per second satellites such that, you know, the, the fail case for us is somebody gets on and they can't, you know, they, yeah. there's, there's demand and we can't serve it, right? That's a fail case and that's sort of historically in flight, that's sort of the, 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 the experience has been that, that a lot of people want to get on and the system has dragged to a halt. So the failure wasn't speed, it was basically capacity and ability to serve that. And so as we move forward, while speed's important and we need to keep speed up and continue to serve all the applications that are gonna be demanded in tomorrow's world, 
it's we also want to make sure every device and every person also gets served at that same quality. Okay, perfect. Yeah, there was a question actually, you brought it up there, Don, about the satellite coverage uh, from Viasat. So um, do you have a view of, I, I guess, in terms of routes or however you want to measure it, you know, what, um, how you're covering the globe uh, in terms of, um, I guess, effectively a uh, signal or connectivity? Yeah, so today, yeah, thanks, Steve. Yeah, so today we're, you know, today we're what you might want to call we're, um, most of our most of our high capacity coverage is in the um, land masses. Um, so think, and, you know, and then we're, you know, and as we move out, we're expanding to pretty much globally. So the Viasat 1, Viasat 2, and our um, Wild Blue 1, Anik F2, KASAT, partner satellites in uh, Brazil and Australia are covering the land masses now. Viasat 2, covered all of the waters, you know, so it's all of North America, you know, Mexico, U.S., Canada, but also includes the Gulf of Mexico, all the islands down into the northern rim of South America, and also covers the air corridor between uh, North America and Europe. And then the European satellites cover all of continental Europe into Middle East and Eastern Europe. And that's that's today's coverage. Uh, you know, again, and I mentioned uh, with partner satellite in Australia, we use an NBN. That's how we're able to serve Qantas's domestic capacity. Um, similar in us in in, um, in Brazil, we're serving Azul's domestic capacity in the same fashion with a local partner, Telebras. And uh, in the future, we as I mentioned Viasat three. There's going to be a constellation of three satellites that will give us uh, global coverage. So each it'll be geo satellites. So each each satellite has uh, you know kind of a third of the Earth, you know, visible Earth view. And so you have three together that gives you global coverage, including all the open oceans and land masses. Okay. Perfect. No, thank you. Thanks again, Don. That's a yeah. great insight. So yeah. So yeah. So uh, I think we can now move on. Uh, we're not doing too badly in terms of time. Um, so and next, I'd like to hand the floor to Doug Lauder. Doug is a SDP and GM of Carrier Services at Boingo, and uh, Boingo are a, uh, a member of the uh, WBA board. So uh, Doug, over to you. All right. I'm gonna try and fill the time here as I try and get to the right screen. Okay, that is the wrong screen. So stop showing my screen. When you're in presentation mode, it gives you a couple options. Can you throw it back to me again so I can try the other one? All right. All right, it's still showing in presenter mode, I assume. That's at least what I think I'm saying there. You are, yeah. You're not on uh, All right. For, uh, you're not in uh, see. presentation view yet. Let me see what happens if I start it over. Okay, I found this on the web, but what happens if... All right. If it's easier, I can drive. Yeah, that might be easier. Okay. That'll be easier. Yeah. Sorry, I tried to, set it, up. Try to no set it up and have it all ready and the best way plans, I guess. Yeah, no worries. All right. So do you have it going? I, there we go. Okay. All right, so while we're while you're kicking it off, Don, it's actually really good to follow you. Uh, we get confused for GoGo -Go quite frequently. Uh, and we always like to say that they are slow and in the air and we are fast and on the ground. So uh, I'm glad I got to say that with Viasat on the line and not GoGo -Go on the line. Uh, so also, uh, it's been fun to watch the couple of experiences with rail and on airplanes because a lot of the same trends that play themselves out in airports have played themselves now on airplanes and on trains. And so we'll try to bring some perspective here from airports as well as other venues. You know, our business started uh, 20 plus years ago. Uh, and really the foundation of our business was getting people connected inside airports and then we exported out from there. Uh, so uh, if we can jump to the next slide just really quick. Uh, so as I said, Boingo started in, in airports. Some of the early connectivity challenges of airports you know, were how do we get the 2% of the people traveling through the airport with these giant brick of laptops connected to Wi-Fi for $25 a day or whatever we were charging back then. And, uh, you know, some of the wireless carriers wanted to get 2G voice services into the airport. The airports re weren't really using the networks. They had traditional, you know, uh, uh, copper and 
other types of networks that were providing voice and data. So everything was kind of parallel. It was kind of sparse. You know, it was it was not really the robust connected experience that, that you see today. Uh, but really what's happened over time is, you know, as uh, devices have all penetrated our pockets, as more uh, airports have leaned on these networks to provide uh, some sort of connection to the to the passenger as well as all the different constituents inside the airports. Really, the networks have become a pretty critical asset inside the airports and a pretty critical tool for both operating and for creating a better experience. And so today, uh, we like to say that a billion consumers travel or pass through our venues annually. Obviously, that is not true in this moment. Uh, but being the op the optimist that I am, I believe it will be true at some point soon. Uh, you know, so the polling is probably pretty accurate with how we're thinking of the world. Uh, I, I tend to feel a bit more optimism around when people are coming back and how quickly we'll be together again. Uh, but when it was full, we did about, you know, a billion people would traverse through our uh, venues each year. So, you know, one seventh of the world's population. And those are venues, stadiums, airports globally, not just here in the U.S. So uh, jumping ahead of slide. So thinking about the airports and uh, things that we're hearing in the industry, uh, I can't help but draw some parallels between the word COVID and 9-11. Uh, so, you know, big event that really changed the way airports think about travel, the way passengers thought about travel. And really, you know, you could replace just about any quote I've been reading with 9-11, and it probably would have held true in 2001, it, it would have been something that would have kind of resonated back then the way it's resonating now. Um, what gives me a lot of confidence today uh, is the lessons we've learned both from 9-11, that's one, and the second is the perpetuation of technology that'll make the leaps that we had to make to get better and more efficient post 9-11 much more shorter in cycle. Uh, so just as a reference point, you know, really, you hear a lot of travelers who traveled pre 9-11 romanticize about pre 9-11 and how awesome it was. And then, you know, got really, really difficult. Security lines were tough. And then, you know, slowly things started to come to market that were there to improve that TSA pre-check and eventually clear. The gap between 2011 and TSA pre-check was pretty massive. The gap between pre-check and clear was very small. I think the, the advancements of innovation and in, in technology post-COVID are going to be you know, faster than that. I think there's a huge uh, reflection going on. There's, you know, an understanding of, of friction drives passenger volume down and the airports will be working like crazy to leverage what's available to them in terms of technology, network and investments to uh, really improve the passenger experience and, and, and learn from the lessons that were made in 2011 or in 2001. Uh, so jump ahead one slide, I'm trying to move a bit quickly. Uh, my team would tell you that if you give me 10 minutes, you should give me two slides. So having 10, I'm at risk here. So challenges um, that we see in terms of what the airports and stadiums and et cetera will have to conquer um, is you know threefold, right? There's, there's what things are they going to do to make uh, us all safer as travelers, right? And then once those decisions have been made about what they are going to do, how do you keep people informed? I think other speakers have talked about this today. How do you ensure that tra the travelers, the, the, the employees, the airlines operating in the airports understand what these processes are? And why that's really important is because the computational power that's now available, both with the devices that we have in our pockets, cloud computation, network connectivity, and bandwidth, is going to make the strategy ever evolving. The strategy is not going to be static. The strategy is going to continue to advance itself and improve based on data and learnings that happen really in real time. So as information becomes available about what's working, what's not, about where there's risk and not risk, those, those strategies will shift and adapt. Some will change entirely. And to be able to communicate out with users and then monitor that traffic. So there's, there's the what do I do? There's the how do I ensure everyone's informed? And then there's the how do I continuously adapt and adjust my strategy based on what I'm learning as we're as we're rolling it out. And so as we've talked to various uh, partners that we work with, both airports and otherwise, really it's kind of setting a foundation of these three things. And so if you jump to the next slide, go back one. Oh no, this is it. Um, so the 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 touchless passenger experience is kind of the catch-all for the various strategies and tools and tactics that are being 
discussed or talked about amongst various constituents, uh, mostly airports, but also stadiums, hotels, office buildings, that will try and reduce the amount of interaction people have physically, uh, keeping people apart, keeping people uh, safe and formed. And so just to talk through the legend at the bottom, just really quick, because I don't want to go through every single use case. I think I just want to highlight kind of the obstacles that we highlighted on the previous slide, health, communication, and monitoring. Uh, those have been brought forward. That's the challenges column. And then the connectivity solution, which we'll get into on the next few slides, is really critical. Just about every solution, every tool, every conversation we've had, it involves some device and some device that needs to connect. Um, or some person who's got to do something who then needs to connect uh, whatever their experiences are or have connection back to the, you know, the cloud or some sort of processing data center. So it's 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 a combination of you know kind of solution to solve the challenge as well as how that solution can connect. Oftentimes it's it's in the venue. So two that I'll highlight is um, one I already talked about a little bit, which is uh, personal identification and checkpoints. You know, uh, biometrics, if anyone's flown recently, Clear has now moved over to retina scanning, so they're not doing fingerprints, so you don't have to touch the sensors anymore. And so I think you'll start to see more and more of that. You know, Clear is something that's kind of a premium product. Some of us pay for it and, you know, gives us that kind of fast lane experience. I think you'll see more of that coming out for the masses. I think it's going to be something that's going to be critical. And of course, if those machines can't connect and they can't process your information and validate that it's you, then those machines all fall down. And then keeping, you know, a readout of, 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 you know, traffic and passenger counts that, you know, the, the, the side benefits that come along with an experience like that for the operation of the airport is actually huge. Uh, and then concessions and point of sale, um, you know, the concessions in an airport are pretty challenging. Uh, prices are high. So they like to inform you when you're paying $27 for a piece of jerky or $35 for a bottle of water. And so there's the challenge of how do we keep people informed of decisions that they are making, yet can we give them the freedom to check out themselves or in a perfect world, just walk right out of the store and charge them for the stuff that they purchased after they've left. Uh, so I think you'll start to see a lot more of the kind of Amazon slash Kroger investment areas where, where there will be a lot of different technologies thought through on how to avoid the interaction and you know the touching experience. You've already seen this in parking garages a lot where you know, in a lot of airports now, it's a it's a credit card in and a credit card out. You're not handing your stuff over at the exit to a person. But I I think you'll see a lot of the investment and a lot of the innovation in these areas really accelerate. Um, so I plan to go through there, but the point is there are challenges. There's going to be obstacles, or sorry, there's going to be solutions that overcome those challenges, and most of those solutions are going to require some sort of connected. Uh, application. So jump to the next slide. Uh, so the connectivity, and as I said, we come back to the connectivity and the tech. And, you know, I've, there's been some good reflection earlier in the webinar today about, you know, where things were previously, I kicked things off that way. And if you think about how uncomplicated networks were back then, they really weren't that complicated. Just 15 years ago, networks were not nearly as complicated as they were today. Um, you know, and and now you're seeing airports, stadiums, whole, all all sorts of venues realize that the network itself is not only does it have a lot of demand, it also has a lot of complexity. There's different transmission protocols, whether it's Wi-Fi, uh, you know, all the different IoT technologies, Bluetooth. Um, all the LTE technologies, all the legacy cellular, CDMA, GSM, there's, there, there's lots of different pull into what is going to use the network, what transmission protocols are going to be used, uh, and then what spectrum is going to be used. Because as more devices have been connected, as more devices consume more power, as we all know, you need more spectrum, you need to use a lot of different sources of spectrum. And whereas 15 years ago, we would have built a Wi-Fi network and a, and a separate cellular network, you know, nowadays you're sharing as much infrastructure as you can and you're consolidating as, as, as many of the use cases onto the single network as you can to reduce costs and to, you know, have operational benefits and to really, you know, kind of have it all centralized and managed. Uh, but the, 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 the real thing to take away from this is that 15 years ago, this was not that difficult. Today, it's really difficult and complicated. And five years from now, when 5G is in full, you know, full deployment, full use, 
new innovation, it's going to be even more complicated, uh, more things, more people, more bandwidth. Uh, so it's just going to get a lot more complicated. And so as as our business has evolved, it, it's actually been pretty fun because we've been able to, you know, stay out in front of it. Our CTO has been way out in front of it. And, you know, we've been able to ensure that the networks we were building three, four years ago, we're going to be ready for CBRS. We're going to be ready for 5G. And so staying on top of those activities to ensure that that when this day happened, even though we couldn't have known that it was going to happen, the networks are going to be prepared for it. Uh, so just always trying to think of head as best you can. Nothing is ever future proof. We always like to say that our our networks are future planned. Uh, and so as these things come to life, it, it makes it a lot easier to scale. Uh, so jump forward to the next slide. So uh, we like to talk about the neutral host. Airports are complicated places. Uh, oh, go back one. We are all in this together, but um, airports are complicated places with many constituents. So, you know, TSA, airlines, travelers, um, sh ride sharing, wireless carriers. And often it's the airport's job, you know, and, and, and it's probably the same with rail. It's going to be the same with uh, stadium operators. Um, it's the airport's job to try and remain as neutral as possible amongst all those different constituents to deliver the best possible experience for everyone. You know, the traveler probably takes the highest priority, uh, but at the same time, you still want to make sure the airports who are generating a lot of revenue and tra you know, connecting those passengers, you want to make sure they're happy. You want to make sure the ride, sh the ride sharing companies are happy when the passengers land or when they're being dropped off. And, and so oftentimes the, the, the airport has to step in and try and mediate between the different constituencies and, and make decisions based on what's kind of the, the right thing to do for, for everyone involved. And we do something really similar on the network side. So our venue partners lean on us to maximize both the efficiency of the spectrum, the transmission protocols, the technology, the private needs, the public needs, um, and in many cases, it's it's not just about who needs what, it's about who needs what and how's it going to be most efficiently uh, leveraged and moved around and then how can we make some money? Because at the end of the day, the airport has to worry about the bottom line and so do we. And so if there's ways to make some money across the network, fantastic. Uh, but really it's about how do we work alongside our venue partners and how do we create a partnership between us and them that aligns our interests, which most of our economic and business models are are tied to managing this chaos on behalf of the airports in the way that we would do it if we were the airport. So we try to be, you know, their partner in this and help them kind of navigate the treacherous, you know, complicated waters of all the different alphabet, you know, soup as well as the new needs that are going to be placed on the network with touchless technology, this and that. So it's 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 even though it's gotten substantially more complicated, it really solidifies what the need is to have a partner who understands all this and who can help bring these solutions forward. And then when when the solution is identified and you figured out how to communicate it and you figure out how you're going to process everything, you don't have to worry about getting it onto the network because the network will be there and the network will support it because you're working with someone who understands that stuff. Um, so jump ahead just one more slide. So. As I said, we're all in this together. Travel won't be the same. Um, you know, I, it's it's going to take a while for it to really feel normal again for most people. It's certainly pretty stressful when I've traveled. Um, but as I said, I remain optimistic. I remain uh, pretty optimistic. Our fighting spirit, the relentless pursuit of, of 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 the freedoms that travel brings, whether it's rail or air or or buses or anything, um, it's just it's it's a very you know uh, spiritual part of the process and I think we will eventually get back to it um, and as an ecosystem I think we will get through this both on the technology side as well as the venue side so uh, ending with that and throwing it back over to you Steve okay thank you very much Doug very interesting um, especially I found the, the the parts around the neutral host and also around the the different access technologies and and how they're working together as well so yeah so we did have a couple of questions come through um, so I think it was more in reference to the slide where you showed uh, other access technologies such as private LT and CBRS um, so it, the question is when should these technologies be used uh, and why not Wi-Fi in your opinion 
So I think every technology is going to have its own, you know, best practice and best use case. Uh, what we're seeing early on in CBRS is two things. One, you want a dedicated pipe uh, that's not going to be interfered with. Like Wi-Fi is pretty messy. It's been around a long time. There's a lot of use on it. And so we've seen kind of two use cases for CBRS, like as, as an early stage. Uh, one is access for either back office or devices or some sort of use case where you either want it in a secure environment where it's not going to overlap with the Wi-Fi traffic, uh, or you just don't want the Wi-Fi uh, network to interfere with that traffic because it's such high priority. And then the second thing that we've seen is because it's not over Wi-Fi, it doesn't have to have a pipe out to the internet. So if you want to keep the traffic and processing only on site and you don't want someone from the outside to be able to hack in, uh, that's also been another interesting case that has established itself with CBRS. Uh, so I, I, I think there's going to be, you know, a smattering of, of, of different concepts. I think access for those who uh, obtain licenses through the licensing process, the, the uh, PALs, I, I think that's going to be fascinating as well to watch how the PALs come in. I think it's, you know, it's going to be fascinating to see how a single CBRS network can accommodate all these different cases. Uh, it is a lot of spectrum, so I, I think it certainly will. Uh, so roaming for the, you know, or, or access slash roaming for those with uh, PAL licenses, or you can kind of segregate the CBRS network off on its own, not have it have access into the outside world and really just use it as its own true private network for processing and computational stuff that is done on site. Uh, so we, we've we've seen a lot of interest in it. There, there's also a lot of interest in in traditionally cellular connected devices that can now use the CBRS network and you know kind of create their own mvno if you will for devices i think that's also somewhat fascinating that we've seen some venues start to look at that there's you know cameras that have been outside that have traditionally used cellular and maybe they're paying 10 bucks a month for a sim card and they're looking to you know make an investment that that will allow them to uh you know perhaps either spend less there or you know have a backup option for the sim card or have sim be the app you know so there's there's a lot of you know really sensitive high value uh, devices and traffic that I'd say is 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 kind of being the first use cases that we're seeing. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, the, and there was one other question I'll bring up and it, it just touched on the, the roaming topic that you just raised there as well, Doug. So what trends are you seeing in terms of, I guess, roaming and specifically uh, offload uh, across the airports right now? So offload is uh, a a pretty you know in terms of use of offload carriers are using offload more and more uh, whether it's passpoint technology that maybe advances at some point into uh, a similar solution over CBRS with LTE technology uh, that remains to be seen but the the use of passpoint and Wi-Fi as a tool to generate incremental capacity in our venues that's something that we've been doing for years and we've seen you know, even more demand today for it than we have elsewhere from a conceptual standpoint. Now, traffic, of course, is is way down. And the notion of offload is that it gives you additional capacity from the macro network, which may not necessarily be needed at the moment because the venues are not that full. However, from a demand perspective and a planning perspective, we're not seeing momentum shift away from the demand for that as an, you know, as a as an access tool for wireless carriers uh, of all kinds to uh, gain additional bandwidth. Oftentimes it's price arbitrage, I'm paying this here, I'll pay that there, you know, for MVNOs. But it's also for carriers who, you know, have maximized what spectrum they have available to them and it's just, you know, too much demand in a venue. So we need as much spectrum as we can get our hands on or, you know, don't want to invest significantly in this venue for an enhanced cellular solution. So I'll just use an offload tool. So we're, from a macro uh, non-cyclical standpoint, it's been really, really positive and strong. And, 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 and I do feel at some point it will morph itself over to CBRS and that will kind of be another form of, of call it offload, if you will. Uh, but, I, but I feel like even though traffic is down, we're still seeing demand really, really strong, you know, just with the overall view that traffic will come back and the problems will also come back. So let's get out in front of it now. Okay. Yes, yeah, so thank you again, Doug. Um, much appreciated. So uh, I think we can uh, we can now move on. Um, so we now have uh, 
uh, Chris Bruce, um, Managing Director for Global Reach. Uh, so Chris, uh, over to you. Uh, hi, hi, Steve. Hopefully you can hear me and see my slides. Loud and clear. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you very much, Steve, for the introduction. And um, hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, delighted to be able to present again on the, the WBA summer series of webinars. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Chris Bruce. I'm the Managing Director of Global Reach Technology, uh, a long term. Uh, association with the WBA for me personally. I've been a board member for the WBA for the best part of 10 years, um, currently with Global Reach Technology, um, but previously with British Telecom, my previous company. Um, Global Reach is, is a, a proud member of the WBA. Uh, we're a software and services company that's, whose mission is to connect users and things seamlessly and securely uh, to Wi-Fi networks and between Wi-Fi networks and between cellular and Wi-Fi networks. And that fits very well, I believe, with the mission and the vision of the WBA. We also happen to be uh, leading members of the Seamless Air Alliance, um, which has relevance today. And uh, we're very much in the forefront of the uh, Seamless Connectivity Initiatives in in-flight. Um, so um, I'm... I'm here to take us home uh, and, and to talk about the enablement of the connected passenger journey. Um, Doug talked about um, uh, a billion uh, customers every year. Our job is to make connections to of users to Wi-Fi networks, and we estimate that we are connecting over three billion sessions a year. So whether it's three billion customers or three billion sessions. Uh, I always think a billion here, a billion there, before you know it, you're talking pretty big numbers. And I think that just uh, indicates the uh, growing uh, demand for Wi-Fi connectivity during the passenger journey. Um, as has been mentioned before, that's tailed off at the moment because of COVID, but um, that long-term trend, I believe, will uh, just continue. So, um, oops, can't see anything. Um, and I view this as a um, multimodal transport journey uh, with, a, with a destination and stopping points along the way in our lives. Um, you know, whether it's uh, the train station, uh, whether it's the, the shopping mall, the office, uh, the venue, uh, whether it's the, the bus or, or, or the maritime, all part of a connected journey. And whilst we can often be connected by cellular. Sometimes that can be a variable experience and sometimes it can be a costly experience. And increasingly we see that both end users and uh, operators want to look for the ultimate optimum mix of uh, technologies, licensed and unlicensed, to deliver the best service at the best um, uh, cost, cost level and price to the end, end user. And, and to do that, we are big proponents of the WBA's open roaming initiative, and I would like to talk about that further during this, this, this talk. But before we do, I'd just like to get your sense of how important you think uh, a seamless Wi-Fi experience is to the overall passenger experience. So how important is that seamless connectivity to that end-to-end -end journey experience of, of taking that mode of transport? So if you wouldn't mind, I think this is uh, this is going to be my only question, so if you could uh, help me out and give me some feedback, I think it would help um, us understand a bit more where, where the audience is coming from. So is it essential? Is it very important? Is it not important? Or in fact, is it not needed at all? Okay, well, Sarah, if you could just let me know when the the, the results are in. The audience has spoken, and guess what? 37% um, say it's essential, 53% very important. Uh, there are some folks here who think it's not important, or in fact not needed, um, so possibly on the wrong webinar. Um, anyway, uh, I, I, I do admit it's a little bit like asking um, dog owners, uh, do, they, do they love their pets, uh, by asking you that question, because probably a self-selecting audience, 
but uh, I think it reinforces my view of, of how significant um, Wi-Fi is to the general passenger experience end-to-end. -end. So I've now lost my slides, so let's, let's see if I can yeah, whoop, move on. So I want to talk about some use cases. Uh, first of all, the connected vehicle, the urban use case. Uh, this is something we're, we're pretty familiar with uh, at Global Reach. Um, and the, at the top left there, you've got uh, a New York City. Um, as has been said before, this is, uh, try and pinch myself, this is in my previous life, pre-COVID, pre when the streets were quite so busy. Um, but we, we work with a partner to deliver a high speed, very high speed, fast Wi-Fi in New York, um, connecting um, outdoor kiosks, which are effectively an advertising mechanism, but also uh, double as, a, uh, as, as an internet connectivity. Uh, there's high speed backhaul into the, the kiosk. Um, but that's just the start. That's the start of a monetization model because there's, there's information that can be collected, GDPR compliant, of course, um, allowing users to auto connect to that Wi Fi using a pass point, um, where uh, uh, connecting users uh, whose cellular phone or other uh, profile uh, a profile on the cellular phone has been downloaded by the uh, the operator onto their sim and they just auto connect to the the wi-fi as they pass the um the kiosk uh, the user notices no difference if they notice any difference they might notice that the internet is faster um because there's a lot of uh backhaul going into those kiosks but from that you can get um telematics information um and if you can think of uh uh, busy urban areas um, and the opportunity to connect the connected car during that journey, particularly cars that are or vehicles that are going around the same footprint, you know, whether it's taxis or buses, you know, we, we're seeing in the next generations of connected car, they could be uploading and generating, you know, more than a terabyte of data a day. Um, and it's unlikely that you'd want to uh, upload that over your cellular network. And I know people say, oh, yeah, we wait till we get home and upload from my home Wi-Fi. Sure, but not everybody can park outside their house. Not everybody um, wants to spend the time leaving their car to upload before they get into their house. So we think that, uh, you know, the um, predominance of Wi-Fi everywhere of a high-speed nature uh, overlaid with passpoint um, enablement to detect um, the uh, the correct device, uh, appropriate device, and allowing that to connect to your Wi-Fi network using a method that the uh, WBA is um, launching in open roaming will be a fantastic way to bring in a huge number, thousands more points of presence, even millions, that can help us uh, deliver this connected world experience and make things like bus operators, train operators, connect their vehicles in a way that may help them with uh, telemetry information around maintenance and parts on a predictive basis as opposed to a reactive basis. Um, we've talked a little bit about COVID and I managed to get hold of some statistics from uh, a company uh, called Icomira, um, who provide on, onboard Wi-Fi um, across many, many countries around the world. And they've run some statistics around Wi-Fi usage on trains and buses um, during this year. And what they've looked at is year on year, the percentage difference over last year. So obviously around the beginning of March, you know, it's pretty much 80%, 90%, I guess, of last year's uh, number of sessions. And these different colors reflect different parts of the world. Um, so Europe, uh, in this instance, UK and Ireland is not included in Europe. Uh, that's not a political statement, that's just the way they've calculated it. Um, but Europe in its various different areas there, the light blue, the dark blue, and the kind of red, um, all recovering pretty well now, um, our upward trajectory. Um, uh, where are we? Light blue, Eastern and Western Europe, I'm quite sure how they define that, but that's 60% of last year. Now in July, uh, the dark blue, uh, Northern Europe, I guess that's the Scandinavian countries, uh, 40 plus percent, um, and red, which is Southern Europe, uh, Spain and Italy and Greece, no doubt, uh, coming back now at 30 percent. 
Um, North America was recovering pretty well, but you know, as we all know, there's been a bit of a setback there and that's dropped back again. And I think, you know, let's be honest, uh, this is probably you're not going to be a linear progression back to normality, um, perhaps at least until we get a vaccine. So we can expect these uh, reverses, no doubt. But I think the point is that there's this general trend, upward trend, and even UK and Ireland that had a tremendous drop um, is now uh, upwardly growing in, in, in July as we start to release the, the lockdown measures and the government starts to encourage folks to uh, to get back to work uh, at their offices anyway. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of uh, reality check we're dealing with. But as uh, you know, Doug has mentioned and, and, and Don has mentioned, there's a number of uh, technology uses that are probably going to come to the fore that allow us to accelerate uh, our digital transformation uh, in terms of contactless uh, and other ways of using technology to allow us to, to make this a, a safe uh, experience. Whoops, going the wrong way. Um, I talked a little bit about open roaming and uh, as I mentioned uh, for, for global reach you know our business is both around enabling venues um, and operators to come together so we work with partners so that their their Wi-Fi network is, is hotspot two ready or if not not hotspot two some other method of, of connecting seamlessly and securely to that network but then also allowing them the opportunity to, to monetize that and, and work as a basis for a, a footprint for mobile offload. So all of these three areas, the traditional venue, the outdoor network, and uh, what my American colleagues now call the carpeted enterprise, uh, what, what we in England call an office, um, all of these kind of use cases very much coming into the form, uh, into the fore because open roaming brings together all the standards that, that previously existed, uh, the RIC standard that WBA has developed over many years that, that allows Wi-Fi operators to, to, to roam and interoperate, um, together with some security uh, capabilities, um, really allow us for the first time to uh, make a step change in the number of venues, the number of locations that can participate in this. Uh, we've moved from operator to operator roaming to suddenly every location, every office being able to participate in this federation. That corporate office there, if you can see it on the right there, that's actually my boring uh, office in central London. I haven't seen it for about three months, um, but in normal times, that's where I work. There's nothing special about it. It's not a destination Wi-Fi venue, um, but I can see that the, the landlords and the, the facilities management company of that building might be interested in participating in this, this open roaming if it meant that uh, guests and visitors coming to the, the office could connect more simply by connecting with a, a directory or, or, or participating uh, in uh, cellular offload, uh, which in itself may not be that particular office, may not be that interested in cellular operators, but what if there's thousands of them, hundreds of thousands of them? That might be interesting. And I think, um, that's what the, the the aha moment was for me, is that actually the uh, WBA standards are going to allow us to scale this thing tremendously, like we've never seen before. And we need it because there's more and more uh, demand uh, to be connected. Um, when we get through this COVID thing, we're going to see a return to busy streets, busy venues, busy locations. And we haven't got enough spectrum and we haven't got, probably haven't got enough finance to fund all of the infrastructure build we will need um, uh, for that. And I'm afraid COVID's probably going to have an economic impact as well on our ability to uh, deploy 5G in the way that people thought. And it's my contention that it will be a, a heterogeneous world with cellular and Wi-Fi for many years to come. So um, in this Making this happen is what I call uh, identity access and access management, bringing together the users or the things um, with the sites and the venues. And, and frankly, that's, that's the role that John Pickett that, that Global Reach provides, um, bringing those two worlds together securely, managing the data uh, secure, securely, uh, complying with GDPR rules, all of which is becoming a more, much more complex world. Uh, particularly with things like Mac randomization coming in that's going to scramble everything for us. 
Uh, it really, I think, brings forward the opportunity for uh, Passpoint, Hotspot 2, and what the WBA is doing with open roaming. For us, uh, transport is really, really important. 66% uh, of UK rail journeys begin or end where global reach enables the Wi-Fi for passengers. So whether it's underground or overground, this is a very, very important area to us. And we, we spend a lot of time uh, working on this and working with our partners on this to deliver a great service. And I really like the statistic that um, I think it was uh, uh, Jim mentioned uh, that, um, well, there's two things actually. First of all, you, you described a hodgepodge of environment, of stakeholders and different parts of the value chain. That's exactly the same in the UK. Um, uh, the, there's train operators, the station owners, there's the, the national uh, network, rail uh, body, there's government, there's private, there's franchises. It's quite a complex environment. And actually, we believe that there is an opportunity to bring all of this together with what I would call a connected passenger journey in what is a, uh, a complex um, stakeholder environment. All the technology, in my view, exists to enable uh, a passenger to go from one train operating company to another uh, station uh, to roam from the, the Wi-Fi on the platform to the Wi-Fi on the train to arrive at a different station run by a different authority to get on an underground or a metro uh, to then find another station, get on a different train operating company to go to a different part of the country and beyond and have all of that authenticated with a single sign-on based on, say, your season ticket or some other identity or, or your cellular phone. And um, to do that, um, you basically connect uh, a data, an ID data store with the authentication engine and, and then we can make that happen so that we can say yes okay um, you're telling us that we, we've got we've seen this device it wants to connect to the network will you authentic will you allow us to authenticate it and that's the role of, of AAA uh, to make that happen and um, the, the other stat that Jim mentioned was that provision of seamless Wi-Fi has increased ridership, I think it was uh, by 2.4 to 2.7 times on the Capital Corridor. Well, that's a pretty impressive uh, stat for a business case as to why you should invest in connectivity uh, for passengers, let alone the, uh, the benefits from, from telemetry and IoT uh, on the, the provision of service. So for us, a really, really important view, and, and this in our view, can be deployed using some of the techniques of, of open roaming, using Passpoint um, and, and both SIM authentication and other methods of uh, delivering profiles to, to users. But it's not all about buses, uh, about trains, um, a similar sort of thing with, with, with buses. Uh, up there, top left, is the, uh, the coach that goes from London to Vista Village in England, uh, which is an outdoor shopping mall experience. And before the um, the uh, the tourists who uh, international tourists that arrive in London, they picked up at a hotel. They connect to the Wi-Fi on the coach. Uh, they can download um, a VIP app, and when they go to the Vista Village, they can then um, use that app to give them a discount against any purchases. So that then allows them to auto connect while they're in the village, while they're on the coach. Um, and allows um, uh, you know the, the the shopping mall and the and the venues to be able to uh, present offers. Um, we also have an, a neat trick there in that we can detect the language of of the uh, the user, so we can serve up other messages in Chinese, Russian, Japanese, whatever language it might be. Of course, to to, to run uh, buses or coaches, you know, there's all kinds of data. Uh, required on 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 loading on on uh, performance and that helps the the operator deliver a, a better service uh, again perhaps predicting when a maintenance or other activity needs to be done on, on the buses to take them out uh, and just keeping the um, the stock uh, rolling stock rolling provision of of free wi-fi of course is helpful for things like social inclusion um, this little lad doing his homework on the way to school on the way home um, and of course, there is that offload opportunity in the same way as the, the kiosk. Why not the bus stop if we can get connectivity to 
that bus stop uh, to power the um, the, uh, the information about when the bus is coming or to upload the content on the advertising. Um, final use case is around maritime, <coughs> something again that we're very much involved in with uh, with satellite providers. Um, uh, crew welfare has been uh, a hot topic in the maritime industry for many years um, on, on shipping, on um, container ships, uh, maritime. Uh, these guys are out there on the water for weeks, if not months. And it can be a lonely experience and mental health and well-being uh, has been often long time been an issue and provision of internet access at an affordable rate has been um, quite a big issue there and we've been working with partners to to deliver a more affordable and fairer way of sharing the costs of, of that connectivity um, via you know the satellite backhaul which you know at the end of the day is not the cheapest backhaul but it's the best if you're out on the water, uh, but for relatively modestly paid sailors um, and crew, um, managing that carefully is really important to them. And of course, during this COVID period, all kinds of other worries on their mind about their families and what's going on at home. Uh, goes without saying, there are a gazillion uh, containers that are need to be tracked and traced. Uh, and there's a whole IoT play here, which again, the Wi-Fi can play a strong part in helping optimize that whole process, uh, minimizing inventory and um, uh, combining it with localization of where things are and then improved efficiency imports. So um, mindful of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close now and ask if there are any questions. Um, uh, as I summarize in that, if it's not already clear, we believe in a, a connected journey and we think that uh, Passpoint and uh, open roaming will be the mechanism to do it for uh, operators of transport to be able to take advantage of a hybrid world covering the multiple different types of uh, uh, bearers that, that Doug mentioned in, um, in his presentation. So Steve, over to you. Yes, no, thanks Chris, perfect. So yeah, um, a couple of questions came through. I'm just mindful of time now. So we're running about 10 blinds, so I'll, um, the question that we had come through was around, I guess, the frictionless nature of Wi-Fi versus the seamless nature. Um, does it need to be completely or fully automated? Uh, are there situations where, say, the user or the venue owner uh, needs to have some level of interaction? Okay. Well, need, I don't know. Um, in my view, and I'll, I'll play my card here, um, connect, putting a barrier to a user to connect to the internet, I think is uh, a mistake. Uh, generally, users want to get on, they want to get on quickly. Uh, that's what they're there to do. Um, I know landing pages and splash pages have been used to send messages and, and, and advertising, but I really question how valuable that is. Um, and I suspect that asking users to um, continue to put in a password and a username every day, which is what Mac randomization will force us to do, uh, will just frustrate users. That said, um, in uh, release three of, of Hotspot 2 um, and something called Catport, there are increasingly ways in which venues can still message their users in session without it becoming a barrier to connection. So uh, I personally believe frictionless Wi-Fi uh, that simulates the, the connection experience of cellular as much as possible, but recognizing that, yeah, there's a need to message and engage with customers is the way forward, whether that's creating an account or whether that's in-session messaging, uh, depends on the business model. Okay, perfect, thanks Chris. So, yeah, so I'm just gonna move forward now. So uh, if you remember at the start of the, uh, of the presentations, we had a poll question uh, relating to the different methods of transportation uh, and which one you, the audience, uh, viewed as most important. So I think we can now show that poll result next. Okay. Yeah. Ah, interesting. So uh, car features, 34%, train and metro, 32%, uh, tram 7%, and an airplane 27%. So so yeah, to the speakers, uh, I don't know who that helps more in terms of uh, budget planning. 2021. Uh, I think uh, Jim 
and uh, and Don, uh, you'll do well in terms of your budget cycles based on this survey. Um, the car side as well. So just for folks to know, next week uh, we have uh, we're fortunate to have GM uh, coming in and also sharing with us their, their views on uh, on on uh, connected vehicle as well. So okay, yes. Yeah, so um, next up, we want to talk a little bit about WBA open roaming in, and you know Chris talked about it you know in his presentation as well. So I'll just take the next five minutes to, just to, just to share what the WBA is is doing. Okay, um, and then we can uh, close out. So, so yeah, so you know, we were lucky enough to hear from you know the speakers today, all these different venues. Uh, so I'm showing them all here. So uh, some of the key uh, venues on the trains, the underground. I mentioned um, you know GM coming next week. Mikhail's talked at the start about the Moscow Metro as well, uh, and what Viasat. You know they have partnerships with many airlines around the globe, of which you know United is one. Um, how do we actually, you know, bring all of this together? So effectively, how could you have this seamless journey of going from one mode of transport and all the places in between? So we heard from McDonald's, Elton Ware, a couple of weeks back about when we were talking about public Wi-Fi, how, what McDonald's is doing uh, in terms of connectivity from an operational standpoint, but also for the, uh, you know, for the people visiting their restaurants. And this view about how you could go from, say, the restaurant, you know, to the underground, to wherever it needs to be, to the home, and just have this seamless uh, experience as well. Okay. And something here that I'm sharing on my screen here, you know, the frustrations uh, that I think over the last 20 years that we've had with Wi-Fi, I do think it's getting better. You know, but issues around or concerns around security, around that user experience and how to connect, things like passwords, complex passwords, and so on, and pieces of paper, QoS. Um, you know, how do we actually guarantee that the quality of the Wi-Fi is, is there and an deployment in terms of coverage and capacity? You know, what, what is it, you know, that Wi-Fi is doing to address that? I think listening to the audience today, we heard a lot about the investments uh, that they or their, uh, their their clients, their customers, you know, are making. Um, I think Jim articulated it very well uh, in terms of the service model uh, that they have for what's happening on board the trains and how they're moving towards next generation hotspot. Um, and just sort of in terms of what's happening, uh, and again, Chris touched on this. Um, we think this is sort of you know culminating in in what we've we've now you know uh, termed WBA open roaming. And just to explain a bit about what that is, so you know, open roaming comprises two components. It's essentially a, a federation of organisations coming together, you know, under the WBA with a common view that they want to create this seamless interoperable Wi-Fi as you go from one venue to another. And then also how you actually turn that into something which is easily managed through a standard you know, framework of, of technical bits and pieces as well. So essentially in, in terms of you know, the, the objectives, the benefits that you know, organizations uh, can, can stand to get from open roaming, um, Part of this is actually about the user experience. Uh, I think that's ultimately you know, the most important thing that we can do. Um, also, how do you actually extend your network reach? So if you're a network provider you're in yourself or an IDP, an identity provider, as Chris mentioned, um, how do you actually get to market quicker, uh, accelerating those interconnect speeds as well? And then looking for innovation, uh, not just from a technical standpoint, but from a business model standpoint as well. You know, how do you actually, you may not be a, a traditional network operator, let's say, but it doesn't stop you coming in and interacting in, in WBA open roaming as well. Okay. Um, and this is the, my last point there. You know, th there are many, many different roles uh, that an organization can take. Um, so down here in the bottom left, you know, we have the, the traditional Wi-Fi network providers. Uh, they don't know too much about roaming. Um, but we have the ecosystem brokers. So, you know, folks like Global Reach uh, that can act as an interconnect or a hubbing partner, you know, to help organizations get engaged. Uh, but also the equipment manufacturers uh, as well can support open roaming uh, as well. And then the identity providers. Um, so yes, folks like you know cellular operators, uh, mobile operators that have a subscriber base, but anybody else, uh, for example, anybody operating a brand loyalty program, anybody you know in an airline, for example, that that translates you know pretty quickly. All of those guys can now come in and take advantage of open roaming uh, 
uh, and get on board in a, in a pretty short you know, time frame. Okay. And then finally, the end users. So, you know, these things, uh, you know, how do we actually get all of these different devices and operating systems and users, you know, connected up as well? They can all participate. Okay. Um, and just the different components, you know, around open roaming. So I mentioned earlier the technical framework. So open roaming is actually built along a, a, you know, different technology standards. So it's effectively trying to create this, uh, this state of art you know, technology that we have here. So how we're addressing security. So open roaming uses a, a public key infrastructure for managing the certificates, you know, to make that service secure. Um, as I mentioned, this idea of the federation. So each member has their own unique WBA identity to identify themselves and enable policy management. And then the RIC standard, so something that the WBA developed or started developing, you know, nearly 10 years back. But how do you actually easily interconnect to another network and then take care of all the data house clearing and settlement uh, also between the different members? And then finally, the use of the best technology. So leveraging passpoint technology from the WFA, the Wi-Fi Alliance, to aid that network discovery and help users and their devices connect more easily. Okay. Um, and you can see here, you know, the open roaming on the right hand side, the open roaming specification effectively, which uh, if you're a member, it tells you how to basically step through all of those different components that I've just talked about so that you can easily uh, get, and get on boarded. Okay. Um, where we are today, so WBA has um, over 100 members in the organization in its entirety today. Uh, 35 members actively playing a part in, in open roaming. Uh, so in the last uh, couple of months, you know, have gotten on board. Um, and in terms of new members, um, we've uh, this year recruited 12 new members specifically that have signed up for open roaming. Okay. And the process to, to get engaged is, is very straightforward. So you can sign up for WBA roaming. It's inclusive for all WBA members. Um, the standards, the specifications, so on that I talked about earlier, uh, that's something that you can start to leverage immediately and see what it takes. Um, you can figure out your different you know, models, business models, you know, how you want to go to market. You can start to select your business partners so they become very visible to you as you join. And then after that, as you're leveraging the technical documentation, you can figure, configure your networks and you're, and you're ready to go. Okay. Um, yeah, and we'd encourage if anybody's, you know, interested in learning more, having a conversation with us, even thinking about something like a, a proof of concept or a trial, then we're open to, you know, to having that discussion, you know, with, your, with you and your organization as well and, and, you know, showing you how it works. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so thank you for your time there. So I think we can start to, uh, to close out. So, um, again, um, big thank you to all of our presenters and panelists today. Did a great job. Uh, I don't think we're too doing too badly in terms of uh, timekeeping. I think we're about 10, 15 minutes so overrunning. Um, also, I'd like to thank again our, our sponsors, Cisco, Intel, and Boingo, Cognitive, Global Reach, Onsemi, Huawei, Wide Connect, Maxima, and Sterlite. You know, without them, uh, this event wouldn't be possible. So, you know, again, a big, big, big thank you for them as well. Okay. And then finally, um, you know, it's just a reminder, but you know this uh, this uh, series that we've been running uh, throughout June and July. Um, you know we're into our our seventh session today on smart transportation. Uh, just a reminder: next week we'll be covering IoT for enterprises and consumers. I mentioned GM GM will be on board as well. Uh, so don't forget to join us, uh, members. It's uh, unlimited to uh, you know to all uh, employees within your company. Uh, as well. Uh, so, you know, if you're not, please feel free to re register and uh, attend for next week as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, again, big thank you. And uh, without further ado, I think we can uh, we can close out. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>